Hey, and welcome back to the Wolverine Live. Glad you're with us tonight. We've got uh, a whole lot to talk about. We're going to start off with Michigan basketball, move into Michigan football, and uh, lots of things going on. There's never an off season, even though that second sport is not playing at present. As always, you see Tom Crawford with us. Uh, he of uh, the Crawford Podcasting Network that he has created. Also, you'll see him on uh, Press Pass on television. Uh, and Tom, tell us where people can get on and, and see that because that is definitely worth the watch. Yeah, you can watch. You just Google uh, uh, Fox 47 Press Pass and the link will come to all our shows, at which airs Sunday night on Fox 47 at 11 o'clock on Sunday night, um, are on demand. A lot of people stay up for it, but a lot of people watch it on demand, and they're all there. And I had an interesting you – know, uh, Jack was in Hong Kong this past – Jack Gebling, so I was the moderator, okay? So when you're the moderator, you don't get to express your opinion. You know, you kind of just steer it. Well, I had Mike Griffith, M. Griff, who covers the Georgia Bulldogs, the SEC Network, formerly covered Michigan State, and Rico Beard, 97-1, from, from uh, the Mike Valeni show with, with Rico. And so um, that was an interesting thing. Where I had to moderate, but I couldn't. I couldn't keep myself from trying to, you know, defend the mighty honor of the University of Michigan here and there. And uh, yet, yeah, I had you, to pose the questions. We had a lot to talk about. Let's just you say. had to try and rein in Rico. I, I know I, that. I was trying to rein him in, but you know what? You know, Rico's a hater. Come on, let let Michigan <laughs> hater. I mean, let let's be real. Well, then he's actually um, a little bit more realistic. That's a relative term, but um, it's been an interesting week. And it's, you know, there, there are moments when it's hard to defend what's going on in Ann Arbor or the athletic department. I mean, you can't defend that they're, they're, they're not in the news all the time. I mean, that's just reality. I mean, every day. But that's part of being uh, America's team, right? Okay? The team that everybody loves or hates, you know. It's kind of very similar to the Dallas Cowboys. And so, uh, you know, it, it goes with the territory, right? Right. We really haven't heard anything about Michigan State since, uh, what, November? <laughs> not football, yeah, and not yeah. football. No, that that's yeah. exactly what I thought. We're going to be talking about. We're going to touch on Michigan State basketball vis-a-vis -vis Michigan basketball and a few other topics tonight because there's some things to get into. We want to start with uh, with Michigan basketball and where they're at. Obviously, in a massive, massive game against uh, Purdue, the Boilermakers, uh, eight and one in the Big Ten and one of the, the nation's top teams playing on Thursday night at Chrysler Arena. Tom Crawford will be there. And, uh, Tom, I want your thoughts. First of all, we're going to talk about Purdue in a more focused manner in a little bit, but talk about Michigan where it's at. Do you believe, and it's tough to start this conversation by saying, can you think, do you think Michigan can start winning consistently when the next foe is Purdue, but you know, you've had this, you've, you've had an off again, on again thing. since Michigan's been in the big 10. They are going to need to put together some, uh, some consistent winning. Can this program yes. at this mm -hmm. point do that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I like how you framed it. Uh, you know, my, my bottom line in the big 10, uh, as far as a uh, number of wins needed to get from the five they have right now, it's to get to 12. And, you know, that might be seem ambitious, but that's what it's going to take when you have a 6-5 and five overall record going into Big Ten play and you have no quad one wins and you have a quad four loss. I mean, that's that's not, not a, a spicy, uh, appealing resume. I, I got a kick out of Mike DeCourcy. I, I'm not sure uh, of the Big Ten network and, and uh, sporting news. I mean, he was talking about, you know, they were talking about Michigan, how far away from the bubble, and he was indicating it was – Quite a few miles away from the bubble right now, but that's right now. Okay, um, they, I, I'm going to go glass half half filled on this to start with. Is this? I mean, other than the Arizona State game, John. I mean, Michigan's been in every game. Okay, they really have. Uh, some games they should not have been in. I mean, they they should have blown people away, and then obviously letting Central. But they've only been really blown out in one game where they where they looked embarrassingly bad. And that was the Arizona State game. I think that was in Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. Other than that, um, you know, they're in the games. But the problem is they – when I – my biggest problem with Michigan, John, is when I look at them 
uh, visually, optically, whether I'm there or I watch them on TV, they're, they're frustrating to watch offensively. Uh, well, they're both sides of the ball, but offensively, they're, they're just seems they're not congruent. Um, they don't have any perimeter. They have very limited perimeter shooting um, other than Jed Howard. Kobe Bufkin, I thought was going to be that guy, but he's playing 34 minutes in some games and only taking 10 shots. And then the Hunter Dickinson dilemma, you know, one, that one particular game, he only had nine shots. And um, so offensively, they, they do that high ball screen a little bit. And but I'm, I'm trying to still figure out, uh, you know, 19 games in a season, what they're trying to do offensively. It looks a little NBA-esque, uh, not surprising with Juwan Howard's background. But I just I don't I don't see um, I don't see as much organization and 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 scheme as I want to. It's like. Uh, and then I'll get off this topic of Michigan's offense, but I mean, when, and, and I hate to, I hate to use Michigan state as an analogy, but when you watch Michigan state come on off a timeout, okay. They always score. And why do they always score? Because they all, they, 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 they run a play that they've been running on all week. And I just wondering what the plays that Michigan's running during the week. I mean, they, they, they I don't see, I don't see that. Maybe I'm not savvy enough, but I mean, do you see that? Am I alone, or where are you at? No, I, I understand. There, there are times where you just don't think they're getting the shots that they could get or should get. And I, right. I you know, I'll take it. You, you're talking about out of bounds plays. I'll talk crunch time. That Iowa game was a microcosm of oh. Michigan's inconsistency. You take the last two minutes. That's a winnable yeah. game. You've dominated that game. Not dominated, but you're winning solidly, winning on the road. You're up seven, two minutes to play. You do not get the shots that you need to get in order to put that one away. You took the time off the clock, and then they're they're throwing up shots that uh, Iowa would be glad that you took, as mm -hmm. opposed to um, shots that close out games. And you know, I, I don't know how much of that is the fact that they're playing without uh, the point guard that they thought they'd be playing That's with true. all year. I mean, you're playing a, a, a young man who is a freshman, and we're going to talk more about Doug McDaniel, but you're talking, you're playing him uh, countless minutes when you thought he would get 10 to 12 a game. So I agree. There's some, there's some head scratching that's going on in terms of this attack. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to go to like on our site during the games, it's, it's Juwan this or Juwan that. I wonder, you know, you've seen them produce results when you've had a Mike Smith at, at point guard or that veteran that's been around for so long. And other guys, even last year, you know, they came around towards the end to get to the Sweet 16. I, uh, I get right back to I want to see what Doug McDaniel, how he grows here in the next month. And I also, you know, he needs some help. He needs Ooh. some help, whether it be – uh, Kobe Bufkin uh, taking more of the load and making some things happen. Uh, he and he has been, played very well at times, believe me. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I see some things that make you wonder what's going on. But uh, again, I do look at um, I, I do look at the fact that they are not playing a uh, a some fifth year senior transfer at the point and that makes a huge difference to me yeah you know i i get a lot of insight much more intelligent insight and being on the hardwood at that level uh from former players uh mm -hmm. with basketball just like i do with football i'm on a podcast weekly with richard ralford the former michigan high wire act in the in the mid 80s and we had wayman Britt on our podcast yesterday wayman Britt was they have an award named after him the wayman Britt defensive player oh, yeah Wayman was on the Final Four when I was in school back in, in the 70s. And and I, I, I can I can feel it in these guys, uh, especially off air, about um, defensively. And Wayman, you know, I mean, when he sees that uh, perimeter or lack of uh, uh, defensive perimeter play, if you know what I mean, at the, from the mm -hmm. guards and, and the open looks. And, and then the biggest bugaboo and with Richard and both of them, as a matter of fact, because Wayman was a six-foot-two forward. Um, who in high school one time had 29 rebounds. I mean, this guy was tough. He had a 44-inch vertical, okay? Right. This guy could get up. But um, the Maryland game really stuck in the crawl of all, all of us 
uh, those offensive rebounds. Remember that Maryland got oh. in the – it was just – it was bad in both halves. Yeah. And it really cost them the game. And as Wayman said, you know, and, and both of them said, you know, that's that's just that's just effort. That's just hustle. And 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 that's up here. And mm-hmm. and and that's not a scheme thing. And and you know, when you're not boxing out and and that that was disheartening in that Maryland game, a team that Michigan had blown out, pummeled in Ann Arbor. Just I know this yeah, between the home and the and, and being a home team and the visitor team is is uh is, is cavernous. I get that. But yeah. still, it was what we saw in that Maryland game, which bothered you know, Richard and, and, and Wayman and, and, you know, it's like Wayman said, I mean, they got to get this thing fixed like now, like right now, or this season is not going to happen for in terms of NC2A. We need to get each of those guys on this podcast before, well, Wayman, the, win- right. before well, the winter. Wayman time. doesn't pull any punches, you know, Richard, you know, I to be too positive, but <laughs> Wayman is like, whoa, he calls it. Any of our listeners that ever watched Wayman Britt, and if you haven't, go back and, and watch the old videos or whatever. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that Wayman Britt, uh, you were talking about some of the, the defensive uh, non-stops, is probably thinking to himself, I could get out there now and stop some people better than that. At times. <laughs> you know what? He looks great. I yeah. mean, he's probably 6'2", 185 like he was, you know, and this guy got drafted by the Washington Redskins. You know, after the final four, because George Allen saw him on playing basketball. Hey, that's when they had 12 rounds in the NFL draft. That guy could play football, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. Hell, he'll go out. You you want him on the podcast? We'll get him on next week if you want him. We'll do it. And that's that would be good. Gives people something to look forward to, and I yeah. would certainly look forward to it. One of the things here, um, I think I know the answer to this one. Well, I'm going to hold off for a minute. Take a look since we've got that schedule up right now. I find something very interesting. First, if Michigan is able to steal this win against Purdue uh, at home, I, I think it's going to come down to Hunter Dickinson having his biggest game of the year against Zach Eady and uh, the, the ability of Michigan. Will it have Jet Howard back? I'm thinking that he may try to give it a go. We're going to wait and see what happens there. But look what happens after that game. Two teams that Michigan's already beaten, but you play them on the road at Penn <laughs> State and at Northwestern. Yeah. Can they, unlike what happened with Maryland, steal those on the road? Or yeah. you tell me, Tom Crawford, which of these games, because they're going to have to steal some on the road to get to 12 wins like you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Where do those come? Well, you know, and I, you know, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about Purdue, but let starting with Purdue. I never thought I would say that uh, when Michigan's hosting the number one team in the in the nation, it's a must-win game. <laughs> but but it really is when you think about how much you know uh, resume building they need. But all kidding aside on that, um, I, I I think that I think well, obviously the home games, but I mean, are you talking about the road games? What are they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ugh, that's me, that's hard. I mean, give me three uh, that they can steal. Give me three steals I, I on the road. They can beat Northwestern on on the road. I, I I truly do, and and I actually think they can beat Penn State on the road. I like that match. I mean, it's going to be hard, mm-hmm. um, but but those are the most conceivable. I mean, you know, I um, at Wisconsin. I don't. Oh, they haven't played them yet, but um, and then Michigan State at home is going to be pro. There's I, I look at these games and yeah I say to myself that ah, that's that's doable but man there's so much slip between the cup and the lip I mean it's like wow that could be spillage there and that could be another loss and so I'm trying to come up with those those seven wins and um, all these games are going to be you know slobber knocking there's not going to be any easy win to get to get that additional seven that they need. Yeah, so I, I think I know the answer to this already, but okay. I, I want your take on it. You know, Michigan State with a worse Big Ten record at this point than Michigan, one more loss already in the Big Ten, uh, is routinely talked about as an NCAA team. Well, sure, they'll, they'll be an NCAA team. Uh, they'll be, you know, uh, Tom Izzo will have them in the, uh, in the big dance in, uh, in March and – you know, as long as they don't run into uh, uh, MTSU, they'll they'll be just fine. 
Whoa. <laughs> no. Um, Michigan, at this point, is regarded by many, including many that wear the maize and blue up in the stands, as yeah, very dicey as a as an NCAA tournament team. I get the the difference in what bottom line results were in the non-conference, but what? Why is that? Why why do you think it is, Tom Crawford, that one is seen as uh, pretty well assured of being in the NCAA and uh, and Michigan not? The last thing I'd like you to do is paint me in the corner and have to defend Michigan State. So shame on you, John. Yeah, well. <laughs> as I say this, but, I, you know, it boils down, let's be realistic when it comes to metrics, okay? And a lot of the NC2A, when you look at the in, at, at Selection Sunday, it's all, you hear about quad one wins. That's the top tier teams, okay? Well, Michigan State has played nine, they've had nine quad one opponents this year. Michigan's had six, okay? Of the nine that Michigan State has played, they've beaten four of them, okay? Michigan has played six quad ones, and they're 0 for 6, mm-hmm. okay? That's pretty glaring. And, I, you know, last thing, I once again, like, I don't want to defend Michigan State, but that's just pure metrics. And then the other thorn for Michigan is the fact, you know, you lose to Central Michigan. You lose to a quad four, uh, a quad four team. And the last thing, you know, they always talk about, yeah, well, you know, just, you know, when the game you're supposed to win, don't have embarrassing losses. That mm-hmm. that was an embarrassing loss. It did kind of ignite Michigan. They had two good Big Ten outings follow, following that game. So there was some silver lining to that. But still, now they're kind of back in the rut a little bit. And then they had a Jet Howard injury. So that's kind of run out of steam. So, yeah, it, to me, it's it's what you've done. And, and they missed an opportunity in non-conference play. Michigan needed to grab one of those. The Virginia game will forever. I'll look at that as the, you know, just, you know, just the ultimate missed opportunity. And so that's the bottom line. Michigan State has has got four quad ones and, they, you know, they played, you know, they've beaten Kentucky. Michigan didn't beat Kentucky, um, you know, and, and thing, you know, and uh, you know, they played Gonzaga. They played, an, you know, they played more and they, they, they should have beaten them. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it's the bottom line of what they've done in quad one. So Virginia, you mentioned, and I, let me add Iowa to that because that was, you know, that's 1A as missed opportunities in this point because that game was all but put away and they didn't do it. All right, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. We still have other basketball topics to talk about, but uh, I, I want to go right to, you You mentioned the uh, the lack of or the dearth of quad one wins it's sitting right there staring at you too it's there for the taking purdue a uh, very highly ranked very highly thought of team that is leading the big 10 in your own building and you know uh, even at purdue last year hunter dickinson had a very very strong game yeah. against zach eden yeah, so uh, you know you're talking about it as a must win I'm thinking of it as a very possible could win for this team. Yeah. Talk about how you look at this Purdue-Michigan matchup. Well, you know, when I say must win, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to happen. But I'm just saying, mean, let's, let's call it a desperate win. I mean, a mm-hmm. win of need, if you will. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, Michigan will match up well. I mean, Michigan will play Purdue tough. I mean, Hunter will play uh, matches up well with Zach Eady as, bad, as, as good as anybody in, in the Big Ten. I mean. Zach E. The thing with Zach E. He doesn't get any fouls called on him, and now everybody's calling. You know, they're all they're all crying BS. But part of it is that um, he doesn't foul people because he doesn't have to. He can. He's so dang tall. He can go vertical, literally by not lifting off the floor much, just by being there. And so he doesn't lean into people. And so he all he alters shots with his sheer size. I mean, I stood in the in the tunnel with him. <laughs> I'll never forget this last year at Chrysler. And I felt like a tiny, tiny person. The only other time that I felt that small physically was uh, standing next to Ralph Sampson when he was playing with the Houston Rockets, when I was covering the Houston Rockets at the summit 40 years ago. But he was not as thick. He was wiry. Uh, this, do- this dude is big. His legs are huge. Uh, Hunter's going to look small against Zach Eady. But if Hunter can play his best game, 
uh, and Michigan's got a shot, but they're going to have to get some perimeter shooting uh, like Purdue will get uh, perimeter shooting from a Fletcher lawyer. Foster's little brother who shot out, you know, he, he fired, you know, he was on all cylinders against Michigan State and, and won the game for them, even though the crowd was mocking the heck out of him. He just put it back in their face. So, and they got shooters on that team and uh, Purdue's well coached. Uh, I think there's a little bit more precision. Let me give an example of what Purdue against Michigan State. Remember that you, you saw a Michigan State game, I'm sure, on MLK Day and Michigan State went, went ahead uh by one point with like four seconds to go you know so purdue's got the ball in four seconds you know they're going to go the length of the court or maybe it was six seconds i'm not sure and um boom right to ed bucket and they knew it was coming and he made it now i'd love to see michigan would they in that scenario everybody knows they're going to go to hunter dickens would they go to hunter dickens that's mm. the frustrating part about this michigan team it guard the guards don't seem to get it to hunter and Hunter and or Hunter doesn't put himself in position to get the ball. I haven't figured that out a little bit of everything, but I, I marveled at how everybody knew that's what Purdue was going to do. That's what they'll do it against Michigan in the same scenario. They'll go to they'll go to Zach Eady. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a there's a reason they're number one in the country, John. So we're right back to guard play. <laughs> yeah, <And Yes. laughs> guard play making sure that you get it to Hunter Dickinson in big uh, situations like that. And Hunter Dickinson being his most assertive self in this game, taking the ball to the hole and taking the ball, getting working to, to get good position, uh, maybe drawing a couple of fouls that Zach Eady doesn't normally get. Uh, because you are at home and you've got a crowd with up behind you and you get a little something going. And I think at times maybe Hunter Dickinson's almost too anxious to when teams are collapsing on him to catch it and immediately yes. pass it. He almost too unselfish mm -hmm. uh, pass it to the perimeter. I agree. But I agree with you that, that they need to shoot from the perimeter very well in this game. So if you've got uh, if you've got your perimeter shooters, the Joey Bakers and the Kobe Bufkins uh, hitting some shots, it makes it different. It makes it a whole lot different if you have, say, a Jet Howard shooting like he did in, against Iowa from the perimeter. Yeah. The question oh, well, is, are you going to have Jet Howard? Yeah. Yeah. Um Joey Baker, you know, uh, remember, I think we remember we talked about that Michigan State game a couple of weeks ago. He over five with a look. He was one for six against Minnesota, including that horrifically uh, bad missed layup. Remember that one? Um, yes. I mean, I mean, Joey's going to have to step up. I mean, he's a fine young man. I got a chat with him at the Michigan Media Day, and and he's he did well at Duke, and but they need him to step up and be that guy where he. As I had Terry Mills on our podcast uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, and he, he's got to be aggressive offensively. He's he's got to be uh, you know kind of this viper guy. He's going to come in there and 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 uh, you know and just sting you. And um, I haven't seen it yet. They need somebody because when you look at that lineup, you, you mentioned about perimeter shooting. I mean, Jed Howard, he can. He's the only guy – and when you look at that lineup, John, you, I'm trying to look at a guy where Michigan can score in bunches, okay, like a Glenn Rice go back in the day. But boom, 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 he's going to hit two or three in a row. And Jed Howard is the only guy who – I mean, Hunter, I guess, can, but um, if he gets the ball in succession. But there's not a perimeter shooter who can score in bunches, in my estimation. And – so I think, you know, there's Kobe's going to have, maybe Kobe's going to be, have to be that other guy besides Jet who can score in bunches where you can get that crowd stirred up, get on a roll. And we really haven't seen that yet. One other thing I want to mention, because before I forget this topic about uh, that lineup, when I was talking to Wayman Britt about it and Richard as well, is when they look at Terrace Reed and Will Chatter. They're they're and I, I I let these guys just talk and I just sit back and you know <laughs> watch, watch their minds go because they're always smarter than me. They were just marveling how much energy those two young men brought off the bench. It wasn't like they were super productive all the time, but
but they brought energy that they've 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 uh, noticed has been lacking with most of the other personnel. The mm. problem with like with the Terrace Reed is how do you have that guy on the court uh, when you're in bonus time? Because you you, I mean, it, it's like hack a shack. I mean, I mean, yeah. tw- I've never seen, I've never seen <laughs> um, a young man struggle at free throw line like that in uh, like ever. You know that I can I can recall, and yeah. when you're shooting 21, per, you might as well foul him because um, it's like a turnover. So it's like a turnover. That's a liability as well. So I mean, there's there's a lot of issues in this lineup. A perimeter shooting uh, that sticks that sticks at the top when you're if you're going to collapse on a hunter, who's going to nail it? And it, it's Joey Baker time. I mean, we're waiting. Yep, no doubt about it. And I, I do know this: if uh, if uh, Jawan Howard had at his disposal the gentleman that you have mentioned so far on this podcast, such as Glenn Rice <laughs> and Richard Relford, and you know he uh, he wouldn't have much, any problems at all right now. Yeah, uh, yeah, at least those fellas in their prime. Yeah, yeah. But what you're dealing with, and I think this is fair, they have had uh, some really uh, difficult injuries. And this was being talked about in the wake of Jet Howard's injury. And, you know, they they had four new starters to begin with. You're still trying to find your feet. You're trying to get your feet under you. And I just, you know, I I think you have to to cut a little more slack in those situations. Um, I do think that you also, if you're – if you're playing at this level, there's a you have to have a uh, a very tough mindset and one that is able to uh, absorb a little criticism. Uh, we had an instance recently where one of the Wolverines uh, reacted fairly strongly to uh, some criticism, whether it be online or whether he heard it shouted at Chrysler Arena, has a bad game. And I'm talking about Doug McDaniel. He's, yeah. uh, you know, a, a freshman guard. He says, I was uh, – he, he tweets out, I was just a, a fan favorite a couple of days ago. I have a bad game and now I'm terrible, need to be benched, the worst player, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Great fan base we have for sure. Make sure you all come out and support on Sunday. We're back at it. Go Blue. Yeah. And I have a couple of thoughts when it comes to that. A – to the young man that what you have heard is not certainly representative of the entire fan base. Mm -hmm. So don't overgeneralize and make it such. And the other thing is try to just shut all that stuff out as much as possible because it's going to be there no matter what, Uh, you you know, they are going to love you. They're going to get on you when you're, uh, when you're struggling. Uh, you know, I, I would address the Michigan fan base, but you're not going to, you're not going to, you're just going to have uh, half the crowd nodding with you. Yeah, we're not going to get on uh, these young guys that, that play. And you're going to have those that, that say, well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm paying my money. I have the right to, uh, to, to criticize or critique or whatever. So your thoughts about that. I know you pay attention to that stuff and see that stuff. Yeah, in fact, I, we we talked about that tweet from Doug on Press Pass on Sunday night, and um, I agree with you um, about it. It doesn't represent the entire Michigan fan base, and that that's just that goes in all fan bases. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, but you you do have to isolate yourself. I mean, you you talk about a lot of these uh, teams that are going through struggling times, and you you uh, hear from the captains, and you hear from uh, or, or the coaches that say, yeah, we're, we're blocking out the outside noise. All that matters is those, you know, 13 or 15 young uh, fellow teammates in the locker room. That's all that matters. And I mean, that, that's a, a, a philosophy you can take. I think, I think he'll learn that, you know, he, he's going to have those ups and downs. And I mean, and the other thing is that Michigan, let's, let's just be real. Um, Michigan is a football school. I mean, it really, I mean, when I was in school and they were good, um, there were games, the, the Michigan, Michigan State game wasn't even sold out in the 70s. They never, and I've talked to Steve Grody, another former player, uh, 
when I was go down there when, and um, he said, you know, it's weird. We went to the final four in 1976 and uh, we didn't, we had, we only had one sell it. Well, I think it was the Indiana game and it was a sold out the same day. I mean, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. The day you went, you went to the final game, you know, it's just, and it's never really been a basketball school. It's gotten better, but I think Michigan basketball fans will, uh, let's just say bail on their team quicker than Michigan football team, uh, Michigan football fans are. I mean, I know a lot of people that uh, are Michigan football fans, passionate, and basketball is just kind of, yeah, let's see how they are this year. And, uh, you know, a lot of these are, you know, passive Michigan fans. And um, I can't relate to that. I mean, to me, Michigan basketball, and you might not believe this, but uh, it's as important to me as Michigan football. And that's why I'm glad when you have, you know, on the Wolverine Live, you have me on both seasons. I mean, absolutely. Very, very few of your guys, uh, the guest, you know, the guest hosts are on both football and basketball. I am because I have an equal passion for both. And um, so I, you know, back to Doug, um, I think. Part of this maturation, you talked about him being a freshman. You know, if this comes up again next year, he won't even comment about it because he'll learn that it's, it's not worth getting into it. And may I just say to our audience, uh, one of the reasons we love Tom Crawford is he cannot be dispassionate about anything. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a topic, he's going to, uh, you know, I don't I don't know yes. about needlepoint and some other things, but yeah. uh, if, it's, if it's related to Michigan athletics, yeah. He's passionate about it. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned yeah. football. We are definitely going to mention football uh, because, as you know, the season never ends. We uh, we continue to have developments to talk about. Uh, and the latest development is Michigan is down one co-offensive coordinator, Matt Weiss, dismissed. Uh, and, you know, Ward Manuel saying, uh, you know, in keeping with the policy of the university, we will not discuss this any further. Uh, you know, we'll we'll see what eventually comes out about that. But, uh, you know, there was uh, an incident that uh, was involving hacking of some sort, uh, computer hacking. And um, my question is, what happens now with Michigan, because you want to, I said, I said this comment to, uh, <laughs> to our mutual friend and my colleague, Chris Ballas. Um, I, I wish Mike Hart knew a little bit more about, uh, designing pass patterns and, uh, developing route trees and things like that, because <clears throat> it would seem to me uh, he would be a natural co-offensive coordinator with Sharon Moore. But what you're looking for, I think Sharon Moore is covering the, the run game aspect. You're looking for to further develop that pass game and, and whether Mike Hart could uh, you know, address that or not. Uh, but we, are, we do know that uh, Michigan is looking at an internal candidate that is uh, – is one of the guys in the background, in the deep background right now, as well as some some names from around the country. Tom Crawford, why don't you take a, a stab at uh, sorting out what you think might happen with uh, Michigan's not only co-offensive coordinator job, but uh, somebody that is going to be coaching quarterbacks and dealing with a passing game. Well, you know, back, uh, starting with Sharon Moore, remember last at the start of the Big Ten Media Days, we were always – and we never really got a clear answer um, about this co-coordinator thing, which I've always struggled with, okay, mm -hmm. because it's like you got the head coach, you got two offensive coordinators, so you literally – you you have three minds going into this decision-making process, and is there too many cooks in the kitchen? I, I would I – would, I would be my own personal opinion. Jerome Moore should just make him the offensive coordinator and then hire one hell of a quarterback coach who is one hell of a recruiter. Okay. And get, you know, just his and Matt Weiss, I, you know, I'm not savvy totally on the skill set, recruiting skill set of, 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 of those 10 coaches that, you know, I, I don't think he was the top recruiter. Is that a, is that a fair statement? 
I think uh, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'll just leave it at that, okay? Yeah. So I would, uh, and he came from an NFL environment other than that, you know, yeah, it came from the NFL environment. I mean, it's like, do we have to go to the Ravens now for this internship program to get to get another coach? I mean, let uh, you know, if you're going to get a quarterback coach, just keep it wide open and uh, and get one hell of a college recruiter um, would be, uh, and maybe that's in, maybe he's switching things around internally, but I, I would go with the one coordinator um, aspect because I think it, it just, um, it doesn't, I think when you got so many minds going at it, and I don't know how that works. I mean, my guy, Mike Hart is a, a run game coordinator, is he not? Um, so he's got a, actually a coordinator tag to his title. And so I, I would like it, uh, you know, ideally. I think Sharon Moore from people I trust um, just say incredible things about him. And 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 Jim him said, remember Jim Harbaugh and this past fall, I mean, at least once or twice, I know vividly that he said he's ready to be a head coach. Well, if he's good, if he's ready to be a head coach, he's ready to be the offensive coordinator by himself for the Michigan Wolverines. Yes. And with the uh, proviso that there is never a, an offensive coordinator by himself when the head coach is a very strong offensive mind himself and <laughs> very, very certain about what he wants to see and what he has seen the past two years that has brought enormous success. You always got that guy delivering the, uh, the you know, veto power if he, need, he feels the need. Is that no. how it, is that is that no? Let me answer. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna post you up on that, John. So is that how that works? How does it work in the Michigan dynamic um, uh, on that on that in that headset communication? I mean, does does, does Harbaugh step in? No. Uh, let's. How does that work? And then what does that do to the OC? I mean, the OC does that piss him off? I mean, I, I I'm just I'm really I'm dying to ever have somebody answer that question. They call it a collaborative effort. And they've never specifically spelled it out, but the sense that I get, and uh, I'm willing for uh, for Jim Harbaugh to come on the the uh, Wolverine <laughs> Live at any point and straighten this out. Okay, but you know you've got a a one that's more run oriented in Sharon Moore and uh, passing game oriented in Matt Weiss last year, and in situations that call for one or the other clearly uh you might have a uh you know play call but i do believe that the head coach would have that veto power and that you know your your guys also have uh a, a quick alternative uh, depending what on what they're seeing from the defense to to make adjustments there so that's that's how i see it coming down um we'll see what they do they you know they may go the route that you're talking about and just have one offensive coordinator. But it seems like uh, Jim Harbaugh likes this collaborative effort and, uh, and certainly he's got reason to like what he has seen results wise from the last couple of years, even though I, I think one of the big things was that coming out of last season. Okay. They need, to develop the passing game more fully and quicker than they did in this past season. Let me just throw out some names that I've uh, tumbled across in uh, various places about maybe the replacement higher and just have you react to, to those. Um, you have the internal guy is named uh, Kirk Campbell and he is a Michigan analyst last year, just last year on threes, uh, Matt Zinitz named him a rising star in the profession and uh, that he is in the mix. He is supposedly heavily involved in Michigan's offense last year. And uh, so you're talking about uh, somebody that already knows the the system. In other uh, places, we've heard, you know, Stanford uh, quarterbacks coach and <coughs> offensive coordinator Davida Pritchard and uh, former Stanford quarterback. We've also heard uh, T. Martin, former Tennessee quarterback, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, a name that some Michigan fans might be <laughs> a little bit familiar with. That would be Brian Greasy. Right. Uh, although the general consensus is 
long shot there. He's already coaching quarterbacks for a team that couldn't make it to the Super Bowl this year yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah, really. <laughs> so your, your thoughts on uh, on those names that are being bandied about? Well, let's just strike the Brian Greasy thing off. <laughs> I don't see that ever – you know, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. Hey, former quarterback coming on home, ABC analyst, whatever, and, uh, you know, all that DNA and what, you know, national champion uh, Woody Mesh with Jim. I just don't see that happening. But, yeah, the T. Martin thing, that that intrigues me because you're getting a different influence. I, I like different influences outside of the program. I think that's good. It works good in companies. It works good in football teams. Um, I don't know. You know, it's like, I, it, it, I'm, I'm, it's so difficult to speculate who's going to be the guy, you know what I mean? Because, um, because I'm not inside the building and I don't, I, I, I don't know what Harbaugh's looking for. And, and so I, you know, I, I, what I ended up doing people, who do you think is going to be the new, you know, the, who the, that, that additional position or the quarterback coach. And it's, it's one of those wait and see things, but the only, I'm going to go back to what I said a few minutes ago. I just, I, I, I think, I think we, um, a part of that job description is just a, a holy terror on the recruiting trail who has relationships in certain markets in this country that Michigan perhaps is weak, that they can do it. Because, you know, when you look at uh, – I'm not just, you know, lamenting about this 2023 class and how, you know, how it's underachieved as coming off a second a CFP and a second Big Ten title and they're sitting at like what, 20, 20th ranked. It did, that part just doesn't make sense. I understand all the – all the, uh, you know, the confusion and uh, disconcerting aspects of Jim Harbaugh flirting with the NFL. But still, even that being said, they should be doing better than they did. Now, he seems to be ramping things up on the 24 class. And he's got a 25 guy in there and all that stuff. And he, he had a top 24 or he had a top recruit with him um, at the uh, Minnesota basketball game. So I think he's into it. OK, but. Get a get a hell of a recruiter, just a, a junkyard dog out there uh, to get the personnel as well as being that guy. Now, who that guy is, I don't know. Uh, it's um, it's beyond my knowledge level. All right, we're coming down the home stretch here, so we're gonna go a little bit uh, lightning round, rapid fire on these last topics. Um, Joel Clatt on the NCAA. I'm sure that you saw this when yes. he tweets out, and I'll I'll quote the tweet. So. NCAA is big mad at U of M football because they contacted recruits during the COVID period and had an analyst coach too much. Meanwhile, Gators football promises a recruit 13 million and can't pay it, but the NCAA has nothing to say about that. Why is the NCAA still a thing? Your thoughts, Tom Crawford, on, uh, on Joel Clatt absolutely skewering the NCAA in this matter. Well, I'll, I'm 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 a huge Joel Clatt fan. I mean, I had literally one on one with him about three years ago at Big Ten. I was hanging on every word. I mean, he's sitting at my table. And I'm like, this dude is unbelievable. And um, and so I've been following him since that conversation. And, and everything he says, everything Joel Clatt says, I agree with. And I agree with this one a hundred, a hundred and ten percent. This is crazy when you when you draw that compare and contrast situation that they have down in Gainesville, Florida. That's absurd. Now. You know, my, you know, with with uh, Jim Harbaugh, uh, you know, not admitting he lied. I mean, what do you mean he lied? I mean, I, I understand they don't, NC Duet doesn't even have any evidence in this thing anyway um, of those level one or those level twos that, and if you deny it, then it becomes a level one with, with the crow. I don't know how that works out. I agree with him 100%. You know, even if you say, it. even if you say, I, I don't remember. Yeah. That, which, could have been the case here. And so where's the proof? Prove it. You know, and I, I, from my understanding, I don't think they have any proof. And w relative to what's going on, where, where we're at in college football right now, why is this such a big thing? So to answer your question in short, 100% with Joel Klatskamp. All right. Uh, remaining portal need for the Wolverines. What, uh, if, if you're making the calls, and you're looking at the 2023 roster for Michigan. If you're going to go out uh, casting for that big fish yet in the portal, what position is Tom Crawford reeling in? Well, I'm reeling in wide receiver. I mean, we're seeing it. We're seeing it at the NFL level. 
um, a wi how wide receivers uh, make a difference. So, I mean, look at the Bengals. Look at all these teams. Look at it. Look at Philly. Um, and in, in college football, you know, with with Ohio State and Ohio and uh, and Georgia. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Michigan is lacking in the wide receiver. I think it's hurt their vertical passing game. I think it's not totally on JJ McCarthy. And um, so uh, that's by far. That's my number one priority. Last thing, and it dials back right to what you were talking about just a couple of minutes ago, and that is recruiting. Does Michigan have a better recruiting year for the class of 2024 than it had for the class just uh, signed? And the last couple of years, really. Yeah, and, and, and you know, part of, maybe, maybe the fact the number of kids are returning um, coming, coming back, you know, people want to play instantly that might have any, something to do with it. Uh, yeah, they will have a better 2024. And I think quite honestly, this, this NIL thing and Valiant and all this stuff is, 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 is ramp it up. And, uh, maybe Santa Ono has something to do, you know, whatever the, whatever the, um, uh, the marketing approach or, uh, just open-mindedness to have an NIL be a larger part of of the Michigan scholarship package, if you will, to mm -hmm. um, for uh, a student athlete. Uh, and I hear that you're going to ramp it up with basketball too. Uh, that's that's why it's going to be. It, that's it seems to me that's being addressed. And I think Michigan's going to have a terrific year next year. Let's be real; they're going to be really, really good. And I think. Uh, you know, stumbling and recruiting the hat in 23 is it, they're going to they're going to be back in the top five in 24. All right. I think uh, you touching on NIL and that last about the year that they're going to have uh, to me is those are two prongs of a three prong uh, recruiting advantage in this coming year. Why it will be better. I do think that NIL will be better. And I think Santa Ono is going to play a role in that in changing the uh, expectations of approach. And uh, I, I do think that things are going to pick up there. Uh, you talk about the type of year they're going to have. I talk about the type of year that they've had in the last two. That's a foundation that kids can look at and say, wow, this, you know, I can be in the playoffs. I can play in a game like Michigan, Ohio State, and uh, play on the side that has won the last two in convincing fashion. Uh, it's you know, there's nothing that you can say uh, if you're negative recruiting Michigan, really, other than if if you can say that, well, you know, Georgia um, took them down pretty hard a couple of years ago. But yeah, I, th those two parts and and the anticipation of the the excellent year that they're going to have. But I think just as importantly, the third prong is okay. Jim Harbaugh, as we understand it, is about to be made one of the highest paid coaches in all of college football and have a bigger buyout and have that uh, thing that you can hold up and say, look, this guy's not going anywhere. So you've got three huge aspects working for you. Yeah. And then, and then the, uh, pretty soon, if you, if, if all these flirtations, he never follows through, then I mean, I mean, recruit probably won't take him serious. Oh, he's coming back. I mean, there's part of that. But the nine million dollar buy, whatever that buyout's going to be, whenever we do see that contract, yep, yep. Um, that would be huge. And I, I, I agree with you. I think that's going to happen. I, I said this last year, but I think maybe this flirtation will. I, I know I've been fatigued by it, and I've been, I've been uh, uh, hugely critical of the of the situation um, with with this uh, flirtation that, that Jim Harbaugh's had. Um, and his role in it, and and and, and Michigan's Ward Manuel's role, the whole thing, and all the drama and all this stuff. But I I I think next year is going to be a better year. I'm gonna I'm gonna think that, and I and I actually believe that. And yeah. the buyout is huge. People don't realize how much impact that will have. And if that's if that's the way it's structured, whenever that thing is inked, and then also get this whole uh, Ward Manuel, you know, Jim Harbaugh, get that smoothed out a little bit, and. And uh, not so that Michigan's in these news pegs, so that will help too. Back to a top 10 recruiting class for Michigan for the 2024 20, year. You heard it here first. At a minimum, we're going right. to go with that. So, Tom Crawford, always fun to talk to you. Great uh, to have you on the Wolverine Live. We will continue this conversation 
next week and check back in because we may have one of those big names that from the oh. past that we've been talking about uh, on the podcast to talk Michigan basketball and talk at length. Absolutely, John. Always a pleasure. Hey, good, batter and different. It's always fun to talk Wolverines and uh, Maize and Blue Athletics. So we'll talk to you next week.